Hi, I'm Richard and thanks for coming along and taking a look at my talk on proximal suspensory desmitis. I thought we would begin by taking a look at the anatomy of the suspensory ligament. It originates uh, at the back of the cannon bone, um, just below the knee or the hock, depending whether you're looking at a fore or a hind limb. And from there, it runs down the back of the cannon bone. Um, and as it approaches the fetlock joint, it splits into two suspensory branches. These branches insert onto the lateral and medial sesamoid bones at the back of the fetlock joint. Um, and then some fibres continue on down into the paston region in the form of the oblique and straight sesamoidian ligaments. These images should help to give you a little bit more understanding of the, um, the layout of the suspensory ligament and its surroundings. Um, if we look at the photo on the right hand side of the screen, we can see um, the cannon bone with the splint bones on either side. Um, the suspensory ligament originates up here at the top of the cannon bone where it has a firm attachment onto the, the back of the cannon bone and then it runs distally down towards the fetlock joint which would be down here. Looking at this image on the left hand side of the screen you can see um, it's a cross section of the horse's leg. Um, obviously front of the leg here, the cannon bone, um, two splint bones on either side of the leg. Um, between the two splint bones and behind the cannon bone we have the suspensory ligament and then we have the deep flexor tendon and the superficial flexor tendon here. Um, and as uh, is hopefully clear, the suspensory ligament is relatively um, confined. Uh, it's surrounded on three sides by um, bony structures, which are obviously relatively inflexible. Um, and then running here between the, um, the suspensory ligament and the flexor tendons, we have an area of thick um, connective tissue which further restrains the suspensory ligament and keeps it in position. The role of the suspensory ligament is to support the fetlock joint during the weight bearing phase of the stride um, and to prevent hyperextension. You can see looking at this um, image on the right hand side of the screen that the, um, the fetlock joint is extended um, and the back or bottom of the fetlock joint is close to coming into contact with the surface of the arena. Um, and it is the suspensory ligament that is um, supporting that fetlock joint and is um, forming the suspensory apparatus and is preventing that joint from sinking any lower. Um, sometimes in older horses uh, that have suffered um, or are suffering with degenerative um, suspensory conditions, they, you will see this appearance um, in their hind limbs uh, when they are at rest. So, um, you know, in this situation, this is um, a sort of a normal appearance for a dressage horse, um, sort of performing, uh, performing certain movements in the dressage test. Um, but unfortunately, in certain sort of older um, older horses that, yeah, as we say, um, suffer from um, degenerative suspensory problems um, or a failure of the suspensory apparatus, um, the fetlock uh, may appear dropped like this, um, you know, continuously um, in sort of all, uh, all all periods of the horse's life. What is proximal suspensory desmitis? It is uh, inflammation of the top third of the suspensory ligament. It can occur in the forelimb or the hind limb, and it can occur in um, just one forelimb or just one hind limb, or it may be, uh, which would be unilateral, or it may be bilateral, which means it occurs in both forelimbs or both hind limbs um, simultaneously. Lameness associated with uh, suspensory ligament desmitis can present in a variety of different ways, depending on the severity and also depending on um, which leg or legs are affected. Um, in the forelimb, we often see a sudden onset lameness, um, which can be relatively mild or, or slightly more severe. Um, 
the lameness is often worse on soft surfaces and it's often worse when the affected leg is on the outside. Um, so if a horse is being lunged, um, lunged on the left rein and it has a right forelimb um, suspensory problem, then the lameness will appear worse with the, uh, the horse on the left rein and the affected leg on the outside of the surface, the outside of the circle, compared to um, if the horse is lunged on the right rein and has the, uh, the affected leg on the inside of the circle. Um, we often see a rapid improvement with rest. Um, so in only sort of uh, a few days, um, a few days rest, then the, uh, the lameness may resolve. Um, it uh, will often reoccur relatively rapidly um, if the horse resumes, uh, resumes exercise. Um, and sometimes rather than lameness, um, we will see a loss of action. Um, yeah, so just sort of the horse's action may become a little bit more sort of scratchy or stilted compared to a sort of a more a smoother, uh, smoother action. Um, in the hind limbs, um, you can see um, uh, you can see obvious lameness um, from time to time, but uh, sometimes it's not always um, as obvious as that. Sometimes what we see is just a loss of performance, um, an inability to um, perform the, the, the same types of uh, movements um, that the horse was performing happily previously, um, or it may be a show jumper or an inventor that started to have poles down. Um, we'll often see behavioural changes, so horses may start to resent um, being asked to do certain uh, certain movements or um, uh, to to tackle certain fences. Um, they may seek to avoid um, to avoid being placed in that situation, um, and sometimes we will see um, sort of secondary problems um, sort of associated with suspensory issues. Um, and one of the commonest things that we see is um, sacroiliac joint pain um, associated with uh, with suspensory ligament issues. And we're not sure whether the SI joint pain comes um, before the suspensory pain and causes suspensory pain or vice versa. But certainly um, it's not uncommon to see SI joint pain um, associated with uh, suspensory ligament desmitis. Suspensory ligament desmitis can affect a wide variety of horses of different breeds and type, um, and it can also affect um, horses working in many different disciplines. Um, it does seem to be particularly prevalent in, in horses which uh, are kind of collected, um, but we do see it in sort of in many different disciplines. So um, we see it in race horses, uh, we see it in event horses, we see it in hunt horses, we see it in showing horses, um, and most frequently we see it in show jumping and dressage horses. Um, interestingly enough, the level of performance of dressage horse does not seem to have an effect on um, how likely a dressage horse is to become to suffer from a suspensory ligament injury. So you may think that um, a horse performing at a higher level would be more likely to suffer from um, a suspensory ligament injury than a horse performing at a lower level, but uh, broadly speaking, they are almost equally likely to suffer from um, to suffer from uh, a suspensory ligament injury. So an elite level dressage horse is two and a half times more likely to suffer. Um, a suspensory ligament injury and a low level dressage horse is 2.6 times more likely to suffer from a suspensory ligament injury. And between 25 to 30% of orthopedic injuries um, to an elite dressage horse will be made up of suspensory ligament injuries. Um, for comparison, an elite show jumper. Um, the suspensory ligament would comprise 16% uh, of orthopaedic injuries um, suffered by uh, show jumping horses. The conformation of the horse will have a significant effect on um, the likelihood of that horse to suffer from uh, proximal suspensory ligament desmitis. 
So on this slide, we have um, some examples of different um, sort of types of confirmation that may be found in the hind limb. Um, obviously labeled A, B, C, and D. And um, you can see that in each different um, diagram, there is a sort of a, a change in angle at the hock um, and a change in sort of uh, position of the, the hind limb relative to the, um, the pelvis and the stifle. Um, it's been found that horses which do suffer, have suffered from proximal suspensory ligament desmitis um, are typically have a larger hock angle than those that have not suffered from um, PSD. So to illustrate this, if we look at um, horse A and horse B, you can see that um, there is a much greater um, degree of bend happening at the level of the hock in horse A than there is in horse B. So this the angle that we are interested in is this one here and you can see that this angle here is smaller so the the angle of the leg is more is more closed um, compared to uh, in horse B where the leg is much straighter and the angle of the hock joint is consequently larger. Um, and it's been found that um, warm blood horses are more likely to have larger hock angles than other types of horse, um, which is why uh, warm blood horses are sort of overrepresented when we um, think about the types of horses that suffer from proximal suspensory desmitis. Um, and we've found, uh, studies have found that there is a 12% increase in the likelihood of suffering proximal suspensory desmitis for every degree of increase in the hock angle. And so you can see this is um, the reason this occurs, because in, in horse A on the left here, when this horse is loading its hind limbs, um, then as the, the load passes through the leg, um, the leg will be compressed and the, the joints will, um, will flex. And a certain amount of flexion will occur through the hock joints. And any residual um, sort of stretch that is required that isn't achieved by sort of flexing, um, flexing of the joints um, is uh, achieved by sort of stretching, if you like, of the suspensory ligament. And obviously, um, if we compare horse A and horse B, then horse A is going to be predisposed to bending its leg more, essentially, in very simple terms. Um, which is going to reduce the strain suffered by its suspensory ligament. Horse B, on the other hand, when its, when its hind limbs are sort of weight bearing during the stance phase, um, the leg is much more similarly um, orientated towards being a sort of a straight, a straight pole, if you like, which means that um, any sort of stretch that is required to occur is going to fall um, the sort of the balance of that load is going to fall a lot harder upon the uh, the suspensory ligament, um, which eventually will um, will accrue damage um, and end up suffering from um, will be at more risk of suffering from um, from proximal suspensory desmitis. In order to diagnose um, proximal suspensory desmitis in a lame horse. Um, we would want to see a positive response to a nerve block of the deep branch of the lateral plantar nerve um, if we're looking at a hind limb lameness. Uh, in conjunction with that, we would also want to rule out um, other nearby structures that may be innervated by the same nerve. Um, and uh, we would do that by using other nerve and joint blocks and also by x-raying and ultrasounding the leg to look at those um, uh, surrounding structures and make sure that those aren't also influencing the, um, the lameness. This diagram uh, is just to show, uh, show you some of the nerves that we're interested in. So as we see coming down the back of the leg here, the tibial nerve runs past the calcaneus 
and uh, becomes the lateral plantar nerve. And coming off the lateral plantar nerve, we see the deep branch of the lateral plantar nerve, which runs down towards the top of the suspensory ligament. And it's this nerve that we, um, we want to numb. Um, and we do that by inserting a needle into the back of the leg just to the um, just below the top of the splint bone, the lateral splint bone, and just we sort of insert that needle down the side of the suspensory ligament and just deposit um, sort of three to four millilitres of local anaesthetic um, next to the nerve, um, which after sort of four or five minutes will numb numb that nerve. Um, and then we can assess whether um, the lameness has improved or not. This slide is to illustrate the um, point that um, we should not rely solely upon the placement of a single nerve block to um, diagnose proximal suspensory desmitis. Um, it's important to bear in mind that when we have placed a nerve block um, and injected some local anaesthetic into a horse's leg, from the moment it's left the needle, um, we have no further control over where the local anaesthetic travels to. Um, the horse takes over um, and the uh, local anaesthetic um, can migrate uh, sort of away from the area that we've injected it into. Um, and it can affect other surrounding structures. So these are examples of two horses which um, were nerve blocked. Um, this horse on the left uh, had a, a nerve block placed um, at the level of the suspensory ligament. Um, it subsequently, uh, the lameness improved um, and when we um, performed some further blocks and then x-rayed the leg, we found that in addition to improving and responding well to a, a nerve block placed um, at the head of the suspensory ligament, um, on a separate occasion, the horse also improved to having the, um, the, the tarsal metatarsal joint blocked. Um, and when we x-rayed, we found that um, the horse was suffering from arthritis um, in the tarsal metatarsal joint. Um, and clearly, the the site where we place the nerve block for a deep branch um, block uh, is very close to um, the site where we would inject local anaesthetic into uh, the TMT joint. So. Um, it's well recognised now that local anaesthetic that placed here can migrate up the leg and can affect um, surrounding structures. Uh, likewise, in the forelimb here, um, this horse was blocked to the suspensory ligament, um, but when the, uh, the top of the suspensory in the knee was x-rayed, um, it was found to also be suffering from some arthritis in the carpal, the middle carpal joint. Um, and obviously the presence of uh, arthritis in these horses um, will have some influence over the, the treatment that these horses require. Um, sometimes it can be the case that a horse blocks to the suspensory um, and has arthritis in the hock or the knee um, as well as a suspensory injury and sometimes it can be that the suspensory isn't in fact injured and um, what we're seeing is just uh, just arthritis in the knee or the hock but it's important to know what's going on in the the structures um, around the leg around the suspensory ligament so that we know how best to treat um, not only the suspensory but also the surrounding structures once we have uh, completed our nerve and joint blocks and um, we have satisfied, satisfied ourselves that we've uh, located the lameness um, to the suspensory ligament, we will then uh, ultrasound the suspensory ligament. Um, obviously, the suspensory is a soft tissue structure, so um, ultrasound is the perhaps the most useful tool we have um, available to us on the yard um, for visualising um, visualizing the suspensory. Uh, and here we see um, two ultrasound images, um, a left and a right leg. Um, 
and the suspensory is uh, demarcated using the sort of yellow um, outline on the left here and on the right here. Um, and you can clearly see that the suspensory on the left hand side is significantly larger um, than the suspensory on the right. And also if you sort of just look at the, the area within the yellow, the, the yellow outline um, on both legs, you'll see that um, the suspensory here on the right hand side, in addition to being smaller, is much more um, homogenous in appearance, um, much more consistent in appearance. So one sort of part of the suspensory looks much the same as any other part of the suspensory ligament, um, compared to this image over here on the left, where uh, in addition to being enlarged, the suspensory ligament has a much more patchy appearance. So you have areas of sort of dark fluid down here, um, a patch running up here, um, compared to the slightly sort of lighter, uh, lighter regions here and here. Um, and the, um, the use of Oxhound, it's not um, infallible, but it does permit us to um, get a reasonable idea of the the condition of the suspensory um, and thus to sort of formulate a sensible um, sensible plan going forward whether that's um, a structured exercise plan um, or whether that's uh, surgery. So the prognosis for horses that have suffered from um, being diagnosed with a suspensory ligament injury varies um, according to whether the, uh, the injury is in the forelimb or the hindlimb. So if you are lucky enough to have a forelimb suspensory ligament uh, injury, um, then your prognosis is, um, is good. Uh, so with conservative treatment, that means um, sort of no surgery, um, no dramatic sort of um, other interventions, 90% um, of those horses will resume um, their athletic activity without suffering a recurrence of the injury um, after approximately sort of six months worth of rehab. However, if you are unfortunate enough to suffer from a hind limb suspensory injury, then your prognosis is um, relatively poor. Only 13% of horses that suffer hind limb suspensory desmitis um, return to full work six months after the injury. So what can we do to improve those odds? Firstly, uh, shoeing. There's been a lot of research um, undertaken into what types of shoe are best and most supportive for horses with um, suspensory ligament injuries. Um, and the current favourite is um, represented by this picture on the right hand side. Um, and it's a broader uh, toed shoe um, with narrower branches. Um, the theory behind this is that a horse wearing this shoe, um, as it places its foot into a um, into an arena surface, the wider part of the shoe at the toe will support the foot and um, mean that relative to the heels, the shoe will sink less at the front and more at the heels. Um, and owing to the way the suspensory ligament um, runs down the lower part of the horse's leg, that should um, transfer more load onto the deep digital flexor tendon, um, which runs down the back of the leg, um, round the navicular bone and attaches on the underside of the horse's foot. Um, and it should reduce the load on the sort of the distal portion of the suspensory ligament, which after it's run down um, past the fetlock, uh, then sort of goes on either side of the pastern and attaches on the front of the pastern. Moving on from shoeing, um, we now come to look at the use of shockwave in um, the use of uh, treating horses with PSD. 
Uh, so just to explain what a shockwave machine is, um, this handpiece uh, is connected to a, um, a machine out of view, um, which has a compressor. Um, when the shockwave machine is activated, then um, a cone within the handpiece uh, is fired repeatedly into a membrane um, at this end of the handpiece, and that membrane is held um, in contact with the horse's leg. And each time the cone impacts the membrane, a shockwave of energy is uh, sent into the horse's leg, um, and that spreads out into the um, into the area uh, around where the the probe is um, is touching the leg, um, and that has um, anti-inflammatory and pain-killing effects on that region. Um, in addition, uh, the suspensory ligament doesn't have a brilliant blood supply because it's a ligament and it doesn't need one. Um, that means that it's able to perform its job um, effectively when asked to do so, up until the point when it gets injured and it starts needing a better blood supply to permit it to heal effectively. Um, so what the use of shockwave also does is it, uh, again in simple terms, it irritates um, the suspensory ligament to a certain extent um, and that stimulates um, more blood flow to go to the suspensory ligament, which um, when you have an injury there is beneficial as the quality um, of healing will be improved. And if you recall um, back to previous slide, 13% um, of horses that suffered a hind limb injury were in work again for full work um, six months after injury. So the remaining 87% um, um, were not in work and were not, uh, have not made a recovery. Um, with the use of shockwave, um, we see that 41% of horses um, now make a return to um, full work without suffering a recurrent injury. So obviously that is a significant improvement on, um, on previous levels. Um, moving beyond uh, shoeing and shockwave, um, we now come to the surgical options for um, treating uh, proximal suspensory desmitis. Um, and these options are neurectomy and fasciotomy. Um, thinking back to the one of the very first slides where we looked at the anatomy of the suspensory ligament, um, you'll recall, I'm sure, that there was um, the suspensory ligament is is hemmed in on sort of three sides by by the cannon bone and then by the medial and lateral splint bones on either side of the um, the suspensory ligament and then behind the suspensory ligament uh, there is a layer of connective tissue which um, when everything is performing well that, uh, that connective tissue holds the suspensory ligament in place. When the suspensory ligament gets unhappy and wants to swell up then um, that connective tissue prevents the ligament from swelling up and that's where a lot of the pain um, comes from because um, the ligament wants to swell up, uh, but it's, um, it's it's restricted by those uh, surrounding structures, um, and you get a uh, essentially a form of compartment syndrome, um, where the more it tries to swell, the greater the pressure it becomes um, subject to, um, and the more painful and um, uncomfortable it gets. So what you can do is to perform a fasciotomy. Um, and that fasciotomy essentially means to cut through the connective tissue um, that's holding the suspensory ligament in position, um, not in position, but is, is sort of restricting its ability to swell. Um, and that will give um, a certain level of relief um, because the, uh, the ligament is then able to, um, to remain in situ, but be sort of uh, swollen. Um, and so some of the pressure is uh, relieved. Um, in addition to the fasciotomy, um, frequently uh, horses will undergo a neurectomy, and that is where the, the deep branch of the lateral plantar nerve that we talked about earlier is um, removed, 
where it um, is innovating the suspensory ligament. Um, and this obviously has the effect of removing the, uh, the pain signals that come from um, a, an inflamed um, suspensory ligament. Um, and that permits the horse to carry on doing its job um, without uh, being in discomfort. So um, when uh, referral hospitals that have undertaken these, um, these surgeries have looked at their figures, they found that um, approximately 80% of horses that underwent surgery um, were back performing at their previous level of athletic activity 12 months after surgery, which is obviously um, a significant improvement um, compared to the, uh, the conservative results um, we saw uh, in previous slides. Um, the response of the horse to, um, to the surgery can be predicted reasonably accurately by the quality of the response to the deep branch of the lateral plantar nerve block. So if you have a horse that blocks out very well um, to, the, to the suspensory nerve block, then um, you would be reasonably confident in assuming that that horse would respond well to having um, a neurectomy and fasciotomy performed. Um, likewise, if uh, your horse didn't respond well to the nerve block, then um, surgery may not be the correct option um, as um, you may find that uh, the surgery just doesn't give the same quality of result, uh, you know, as good a quality um, outcome as you wish. Um, it's important there's obviously certain prerequisites um, for a horse uh, undergoing surgery. Um, it can only be done on those horses where the suspensory is sore and inflamed, but still structurally sound. Um, you would be very unwise to um, perform surgery on a horse that had a sort of a degenerating suspensory ligament um, or a suspensory ligament with a, a very significant level of, of structural change within it um, because obviously once you have um, removed the nerve sensation to the suspensory ligament um, the horse would then be able to to use it and overuse it and that would be potentially likely to um, to cause a significant breakdown um, in the whole suspensory apparatus which could result in the um, the euthanasia of the horse that concludes my uh, talk on proximal suspensory ligament desmitis um, thank you for listening if you have any uh, questions or any follow-up um, or you wanted to get in contact with me um, then please feel free to do so my email is rich at pinkmechwine.com um, or you can get hold of me on the office number which is 01725 518 309 thanks very much